If God sent an army of angels to exterminate humanity for their sins, what would you do? These monsters won't stop until everyone on the planet is dead, so I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the wrath of God in Legion. This angel is a total badass. Michael here has just fallen from the sky and lands in a dark alleyway. Taking a moment to catch his breath, he unfolds his giant wings only to rip them out of his back, setting himself free from his shackles. This angel is disobeying orders and is about to ruin God's plan to exterminate the entire human race. He breaks into a warehouse and finds a massive armory full of weapons, bagging them up for his mission. It's enough for an entire army, but the angel doesn't realize police officers are patrolling right outside. That's when the side of a building explodes into the street leaving a cross-shaped hole in the wall, and the police officers rush out of the car, demanding he put his bags down. The angel surrenders as the officer moves in to arrest him, but he quickly spins around, raising the gun to his head, and takes the man hostage. Suddenly, the other cop begins shaking as something takes control of his body. He's being possessed, and with his eyes and teeth transformed, he asks Michael why he's betraying God. The man tells him he won't let God kill the baby, and is following his own plan now, but the cop makes it clear that he'll be punished for his disobedience. Acting quickly, Michael takes the man down before grabbing his weapons and hijacking the police car, driving into the horizon as the lights of the city go dark. He's determined to save this unborn baby and knows that if he fails, every human on earth will be exterminated. Later that morning, Kyle here is lost in the desert and pulls over at this diner in the middle of nowhere. He approaches to ask for directions and finds this pregnant waitress Charlie outside. The man tells her that smoking is bad for the baby, but she doesn't seem to care and suggests he take a break from driving, leading him into the restaurant. Approaching the counter, Kyle asks if he can use their phone to make a call, but the man is interrupted as the owner walks in behind him, and that's when he notices something strange. The TV has turned to static, and he walks over to try to figure out what's going on. Slapping the screen, it shows an emergency message and warns them that this is not a test. Everyone in the diner is confused, and the chef turns on the radio to check if there's any news, but every station is dead. Something is going on, but they'll have no way of finding out until it's too late. Everyone begins to panic as they try to figure out what's going on, and that's when Kyle here walks in with bad news. The phone line is down, and they have no way to contact the outside world. Okay, this is not a good sign. It's pretty normal to have bad reception in the desert, but when the television, phone lines, and radio are all completely dead, it can't be a coincidence. This could mean that the closest radio tower has gone out, because all three of these devices use radio waves to transmit information. But the strange thing is that the television is still receiving a signal. This is called a standard emergency warning signal, and is only broadcast when there is extreme danger like a natural disaster or an attack on U.S. soil. The scariest part about this is that if there's no other information being reported, Reported. It could mean that the news organizations are in the danger zone and have already been evacuated. Now, it's logical to get in your car and drive to the nearest town to find out what's going on. The problem is, these guys are in the middle of the Mojave Desert, which only has two major roads, and they're each over 150 miles long, so it could take you hours only to realize you're driving straight into danger. The one exception is if there's a giant dust cloud in the distance, in which case we should pack up and start driving in the opposite direction. If you look at the trail pattern of this thing, you can tell that it's clearly moving towards the them, but these idiots never even bothered looking outside to find out what was going on. Now, this wasn't the only mistake being made so far. Michael here is on a mission to save the world, but I guarantee if he had brought his Infinity Stone, it would have made his job a lot easier. The truth is, if you're expecting to save the entire human race from God's wrath, you'll have to do much better than stockpiling a handful of guns. The next mistake was that within seconds of landing on Earth, he ripped out his angel wings, which are the most valuable asset he has to accomplish his mission. Later in the movie, we can see these guys not only flying, but literally blocking bullets with them, and now he's only got the strength of a normal human. If it were me, I would have kept the wings and used them to help me steal a much better weapon to fight off God's entire army. Since the only thing deadly enough to give us a fighting chance are nuclear warheads, this angel's only option is to keep his superpower wings and break into a weapons facility. It might sound crazy, but when you consider that we just disobeyed God to stop him from wiping out the human race, we have to think a lot bigger than 20 guns in a warehouse. For a regular human, this strategy would be insane, but Michael here is an archangel who the Bible describes as the leader of the heavenly hosts and God's most powerful angel. If this idiot hadn't cut off his wings, it's not impossible to think that with a ranking like that, he might have been able to pull this off. Moments later, an elderly woman enters the diner and sits down at a table, but there's something strange about her. The waitress comes in to serve her lunch, and that's when the old woman asks about Charlie's pregnancy, telling her that the baby is going to burn in hell. The others can't believe what they've just heard, and the waitress storms off to the kitchen, but the elderly woman won't stop being a Karen. She insults another customer, accusing her of being a horrible wife, so her husband gets up to demand an apology, and that was his biggest mistake. Suddenly, the old woman lunges forward and bites down straight
straight into his neck. The others back away in shock as she screams that they're all going to die, and the chef throws a frying pan straight at her head, but it barely faces her. Standing up, the woman runs to the mother and climbs up the wall like an insect. No one has any idea what to do, but the manager pulls out his shotgun and starts shooting at her. She dodges every shot and drops down behind him, knocking the man across the room. With his dad unconscious, G Peer grabs the gun and aims it at the woman, but can't bring himself to pull the trigger. The old lady slides across the floor to attack him, but she suddenly falls to the ground dead. Looking up from her body, he realizes that Kyle saved his life and shot her at the last second. It's horrifying, but soon they'll be facing hundreds of these creatures ordered by God to kill this woman's baby. The group panics as they realize the father needs medical attention, so they carry him out of the diner and into Kyle's car. They have to get into a hospital before he bleeds out, but as they're driving, the daughter notices something strange. A giant dust cloud is gathering in the distance, but she hears a buzzing sound getting closer. That's when they realize they're driving straight into a massive swarm of bugs, and suddenly the insects flood the car, making it impossible for them to see anything. Meanwhile at the diner, the manager notices that his son Jeep is barely keeping himself together. He feels guilty that he couldn't fire the gun, but his dad reassures him it's okay, explaining that taking a life should never be easy, but they're interrupted as they hear a car pull up to the restaurant. Heading outside, the man finds the others have returned and they're all bugging out. He asks them why they've come back, but then he sees a giant swarm of insects headed their way, and it's terrifying. Okay, if a scrawny little grandma can do this to someone, these people need to take the situation a lot more seriously. Jeep literally watched her Will Smith his dad right across the face, but he still couldn't bring himself to pull the trigger. This is a problem because we need to rely on every member of the group for protection, and one weak link can get us all killed. So the smartest thing to do is create a plan to kill these creatures more effectively. If it were me, I would use the environment to our advantage and have everyone climb behind the kitchen counter here. This adds a barrier of protection and will never Never allow the monster to single us out or sneak up behind us. There are also a lot more sharp and heavy objects in this part of the diner, and everyone who doesn't have a gun on them can still contribute by throwing skillets and knives to slow the woman down. When facing a dangerous threat, it's a common survival tactic to place as many barriers as possible between you and your enemy, and for this reason, we have to consider barricading this place in case more of them show up. Now, as for these guys, the first problem is that there's no reason they need four people to drive the husband to the hospital. They're leaving behind a coward and an old man to protect this pregnant woman from any more monsters, which is not a good idea. It would have been much smarter to let the wife take him alone because it's less risky, and there's more people to defend the diner. The next problem is that they gave up way too quickly. If you're driving through a massive cloud of insects, it would make a lot more sense to close off the air vents in the car to stop outside air from coming in. It's the only reason they got swarmed, and if they made this one simple change, they might have gotten the man to a hospital instead of turning back around. The group examined the corpse of the elderly woman and discovers her body is getting warmer even though she's been dead for over an hour. It's not normal, so they take the woman outside to get rid of her, but that's when they notice a police car coming their way. The waitress thinks that they're here to help and runs out of the diner, but that's when she realizes this man isn't a police officer. Expecting the worst, Jeep's dad points a shotgun at him, threatening to blow his brains out unless he proves he's human. The guy opens his mouth and reveals a normal set of teeth, proving he's not like the old lady, and introduces himself as Michael. Relieved, the dad explains that a customer suddenly attacked them and asks what he's doing here, but Michael doesn't answer. He walks towards the group as the manager aims the gun at his chest, but the angel quickly snatches it out of his hands. He points it straight at the guy's head, ready to pull the trigger when he notices something behind them and warns the group that more creatures are already on their way. He gives back the shotgun and walks over to the police car, opening the trunk so he can start arming the group. Heading towards the diner, he warns the waitress to be careful and enters the building to fortify the place. Everyone starts barricading the doors, waiting inside until nightfall, but this won't be enough to stop the horns. Suddenly, all the lights shut off, so they have no choice but to go on the roof with flashlights and look for the creatures coming their way. That's when the chef hears an ice cream truck song playing in the distance, and they all watch as the vehicle gets closer to the building. It comes to a stop in the middle of the road, and the men aim their weapons as the driver steps out. He looks like a normal human, but then he spots them and lets out a blood-chilling scream. 
It's terrifying as his limbs start stretching out, and he rushes at the survivors like a bat out of hell. The men fire their guns, killing the monster, but this is only the beginning. In the distance, dozens of vehicles are headed their way, and every single driver is a creature coming to destroy them. Michael orders the men to open fire, and they shoot up the vehicles, taking them out one by one, but the angel looks across to find more are coming from the other direction. The survivors don't stand a chance, and Michael pulls on a rocket launcher, stopping the car dead in its tracks, but they're going to need a lot more firepower if they want to live through the night. Okay, this is terrifying, but if the group had used their time better, it would have been a lot easier to survive the situation. To their credit, they barricaded the doors and windows, but if this is the only thing you do to protect yourself, then you get what you deserve. For some reason, these people have completely forgotten that this place isn't just a diner, but also a gas station, and I would be using that to my advantage. If it were me, I would tell the cook to gather as many beer bottles as they have in stock, so we can fill them with gasoline and turn them all into Molotov cocktails. As simple as these weapons are, they're insanely good at stopping vehicles because the fires spread quickly and are difficult to put out. This has been demonstrated recently in Ukraine as one of the most effective ways for civilians to fight back against a military convoy. If we can set fire to their entire fleet of cars, this gives us a massive advantage because the monsters inside will burn and any who escape won't be able to drive away. This means they'll be stranded in the line of gunfire and once we've killed them all, we can use their cars as an extra barrier for the next invasion. I would also try setting traps outside by placing flames flammable items close to the road like this butane tank so we can blow it up when the monsters get near. Then I would glue obstructive items in the road and around the diner so they won't be able to drive the cars into the building. It might sound like an odd strategy, but this is exactly what the Hong Kong protesters did in 2019 against the police force crackdown. They took hundreds of bricks and glued them onto the streets so police vehicles couldn't drive through and force the protesters to retreat. Now this place might not have tons of bricks on hand, but there's a mechanic shop in the back and I wouldn't be surprised if they had all kinds of different epoxy. They could have used car parts and other materials lying around to glue onto the road, adding more obstructive barriers when the monsters return. These people simply didn't use their time effectively, and I guarantee if everyone in this diner was Ukrainian, they would have been much better prepared. The cars have finally made it past their line of defense, and all the passengers come out, marching towards the diner. Seeing a little girl, Kyle here can't bring himself to kill her and stop shooting, but Michael urges them to keep firing or else they're all going to die. Inside, the survivors wait in the dark as they listen to the gunfire when suddenly a monster comes crashing through the window. They've breached the building and the group looks around the room in terror. They don't know where the creature has gone and are scared that it's going to attack them. Suddenly, the husband gets pulled across the floor and out of the window. The wife runs over and holds onto him for dear life as the others join in to help, trying their best to keep him inside. Another monster grabs into the waitress, pulling her out of the window and Michael cuts off the creature's arm to save her, but it's too late for the husband as he gets dragged out of the diner. Up on the roof, Kyle here knows notices all the monsters are retreating, and he's relieved. They've managed to survive the night at the cost of a single life, making that one down with eight more to go. Michael holds the wife back from running outside and notices the waitress is in pain. He scolds Charlie for putting herself at risk trying to save the husband and tells the others that someone has to keep watch on the roof, but the group has had enough. Angry, the diner manager walks over demanding to know what is going on, and he's not going to like the answer. Gathering the survivors, Michael explains that God has become angry with humans and decided to wipe them out by ordering his angels to possess them, but only the weak-willed can be controlled. It sounds unbelievable, and Jeep asks him how he could possibly know this. That's when the angel tells them he used to be one, but betrayed God in order to protect Charlie. For some reason, her baby is the key to humanity's survival, and if they both die, it guarantees that every human will be destroyed. The only chance they have of stopping the apocalypse is for the waitress to give birth, and the angel knows for a fact that it will happen soon. It's a terrifying situation, and to make matters worse, Michael tells them that the monsters will be back with reinforcements, dead set on killing this child. Okay, if anyone in this diner is an atheist, they should be shitting their pants right now. Not only is God real, but he's also hitting control alt delete on the entire human race. This is terrifying, but if we are paying attention, there's one key observation here that could save us all from extinction. We've just learned that the only people who get possessed are weak-willed people, and since everyone in this building is still human, it means they're all stubborn enough to not be affected. Now, the problem is that if any of us lose our resolve, we might become vulnerable to getting possessed by an enemy angel, and that's a risk we can't let happen. 
G Pierce seems like he might be the weakest link. So if it were me, I would quarantine anyone who's starting to talk negatively or act depressed. This ensures that if any members of our own group transform, we can easily kill them without risking anyone else's life. Now, if we take a step back to look at the bigger picture, it's pretty easy to realize that God has no idea what he's doing. Michael here explained that God wants to exterminate his creation because humans have become too evil and violent. But the truth is, it's easy to forget just how terrifying the Old Testament is and how much of that violence was ordered by God himself. For starters, he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, killing every man, woman, and child that lived there. Then, Moses begged God to soften the Pharaoh's heart and convince him to let the Jews leave Egypt. But God decided that cursing them with plagues and killing all of their first born sons was a better idea. Later, when the Jews were stranded in the desert, they began worshipping a golden calf. So God ordered Moses and Aaron to slaughter 3,000 of them to show that their father in heaven was feeling a little bit jealous. This barely scratches the surface of the horrors you'll find in the Bible, and it happens to be the best-selling book in history. With this in mind, somebody needs to explain to this dude that now thousands of years later, we live in the most peaceful era in the history of our species. The printing press allowed us to spread worldviews that valued human life, and people began to oppose slavery slavery, torture, and cruel punishments like the stockade. The rights revolution saw an uprising to push for better civil rights, and now modern politicians use diplomacy to solve problems instead of going to war for glory like kings from the Middle Ages. It's clear that the world has dramatically improved over the course of human history, and since God exists outside of time, 10,000 years of social development would be instantaneous to him, so he has no reason to be upset. With this in mind, if I were Michael here, I would have tried to show God evidence that as a species, humans are not that bad. Bad. And it's a much safer alternative than leaving heaven to fight the entire angel army. That morning, the manager is keeping watch on the roof and sees the dark cloud spreading across into the horizon. It's a sign of the next attack, but the man falls asleep at his post and he won't be able to warn the others until it's too late. Downstairs, the wife wakes up hearing someone call her name. She follows the sound of the voice to the office and peeks outside the window to see something horrifying. Her husband has been chained to an upside down cross with his skin covered in disgusting blisters and he screams out for help. Desperate to save him, the wife quickly removes the furniture blocking the door but is interrupted by Kyle. She throws him off, knocking the man unconscious, and her daughter runs to the room, trying to convince her not to go outside. Panicking, the woman pushes her away and runs out of the building to rescue her husband, but that was her biggest mistake. The chef chases after her and grabs a hold of the wife right before her husband bursts apart into a burning puddle of acid. The chef manages to carry her back inside the diner, but he suddenly falls to the ground dead. His back was melted off from the acid, and that makes two down with seven more to go. Worried she might go outside again, they tied the woman to a chair and her daughter gives her some medicine to cope with the situation, but she suddenly blames her husband's death on the girl. It's a brutal accusation, but Kyle here interrupts them and asks the daughter to help him find a working radio station. Fiddling with the antenna, she catches a transmission from an active station. The announcer reports that the effects of the apocalypse have spread throughout the state, but thankfully, survivors have started to organize and fight back. The group thinks it might be safe enough to leave, but Michael argues they have to stay. If the waitress goes into labor during the trip, both her and the baby will face certain death, dooming everyone on the planet. That night, the survivors are waiting for the next attack to come when the power suddenly turns back on. It seems like everything might be okay, but the group notices a van heading straight for the diner. Kyle here aims his gun, ready to kill whatever comes out of the vehicle, but stops as he realizes it's a normal human. The driver gets out of the car and tries to fill up on gas, but that's when Kyle notices a child in the back seat. That must be the driver's son, and to make matters worse, more vehicles are headed their way. He quickly realizes that the monsters must have switched the power back on to lure people to the gas station. It's a trap, and Kyle warns the dad to get back into his car, firing a warning shot in the air. The man tries to get back into the vehicle, but he's suddenly run over, and the crash sends him flying before a group of punks get out of their cars and pull the little boy from the van. Okay, this is definitely a trap. Earlier, these creatures used the mother's emotions against her to lure the woman out of the diner, and it means they're playing mind games as a part of their strategy to take us out. For Kyle here, this guy's in the middle divorcing his wife and barely gets to see his kid. So if they already know exactly where our triggers are, they will use them against us when it matters most. The best way to prevent this from happening is by using a buddy system to keep each other accountable, and that is going to be key to our survival. If we partner up with someone who doesn't have the same weakness as us, we'll have a better chance of stopping the creatures from luring us out one by one and doing something stupid to risk everyone's lives. Now, if these angels are setting traps for us, then fighting them might be playing right into their hands. That's why instead of letting them draw us out into combat, our best course of action is to give birth to this baby as quickly as possible. According to Michael here, if this is the one condition that stops the 
apocalypse, it needs to be considered the highest priority. It just so happens that there are some emergency methods to induce early labor, and the most effective is sex. The reason is because it releases a hormone called oxytocin, which has been known to jumpstart the labor process. The good news is, Sheep and Charlie here already have a close friendship, which makes this guy the most suitable candidate for the job, if she consents. As uncomfortable as it might sound, we're talking about saving the entire human race, and to be fair, if we're not willing to spend three minutes to explore this solution, then all hope is lost. Now, if this option is off the table, we can try some more basic methods like drinking castor oil if they have any, because it releases a chemical called prostaglandin, which can trigger contractions. Hospitals normally use synthetic versions of both oxytocin and prostaglandin to medically induce labor, so if these methods can naturally produce those chemicals, it's going to be our best bet for ending the apocalypse as fast as possible. Desperate to save the boy, Kyle here climbs down the roof and runs to the car, taking out any monsters in his path. He picks the kid up and carries him away, but slowly begins to notice that the possessed have stopped attacking him, and the boy is humming a creepy song. He's possessed, and this was the trap all along as he bites into the man's throat, making that three down with six more to go. There's nothing the other survivors can do except watch, but Audrey here is furious and wants revenge. Jumping down to the ground, she attacks the monsters and is about to finish the kid off, but her gun has run out of bullets. She's surrounded, and with no good options, the girl runs for the van, climbing inside a safety as the creatures try to break in. Meanwhile, the waitress confronts the angel, demanding he save the girl or else she'll go out and do it herself. Walking past him, she grabs a gun off the table, but Michael stops her. He'll do anything to keep her child safe, and giving in, tells Jeep to open the door. The angel walks outside and guns down the creatures with deadly accuracy, before grabbing a gas pump and setting them on fire, scaring the rest of the monsters off. With the area finally safe, he opens the door and guides the daughter back to the diner, jumping inside before the entire gas pump explodes. The waitress rides to the kitchen, fetching water for birds, but when she turns around, she sees the possessed child standing in front of her, and he's holding a knife. The kid runs at the woman, slashing at her belly, and goes in for the killing blow, but Charlie holds up a dining tray to defend herself at the last second. Seizing her opportunity, she kicks the kid away and Michael joins her, ready to kill the monster, but the child has disappeared. That's when the lights suddenly shut off, and everyone gets out flashlights to look for the possessed boy. Jeep here finds a trail of blood on the floor, and sees handprints across the ceiling. It somehow climbed up the walls, just like the old lady, but the tracks stop right above them. All of a sudden, the child jumps into the manager, strangling him from behind. Behind. But the Archangel throws the kid off of his back, and this time, Jeep makes sure the creature stays dead. They've managed to survive another attack, but that's when Charlie begins going into labor. Michael knows this might be their one shot at ending the apocalypse and comforts the waitress, but a loud sound rumbles in the distance. Someone is coming, and the Angel urges the woman to push the baby out before it's too late. Outside the diner, a horde of possessed people have already gathered, and they're waiting for their leader to arrive. Okay, I'm officially creeped out. These angels are just standing around like they're waiting for something to happen, and they would only do this if we were right where they wanted us to be. This is terrifying, and you might think it's a good idea to abandon ship because you don't want to be here when something worse shows up to kill us. Now, if you look at this sign, the diner is 50 miles away from any other rest stop, and since the angels possessed these people while they were on the road, it's very likely that they're all pretty low on gas. That means if we run to the car and drive off, a lot of these monsters might run out of fuel trying to chase us down, and we'll be able to escape. Now, as logical as this sounds, the truth is it would be a terrible strategy. The fact that this place is in the middle of nowhere might be one of the biggest advantages we have, because it's far away from any population center where thousands of angels will be trying to attack us. As long as we stay here, the enemy has to travel to us in smaller numbers, bringing resources from the city straight to our doorstep, and it's giving us a better chance to fight them off. Having said that, if we're going to stay here and prepare for the next invasion, we have to assume that anything we see is designed to lure us out and get us killed. That means when a family of humans drives up in a panic, we have to consider this a trap and leave them to die. It's cold-blooded, but the truth is that saving them would actually be far worse for our survival. One thing we all know about young children is that they're less educated, have less self-control, and are highly impressionable. Since the only ones who can be possessed are weak-willed people, this means children are the perfect candidates for the angels to possess, and there's even scientific proof to back this theory up. In 19 in 1972, scientists created a study famously called the Marshmallow Test, where they put young kids in a room with a single marshmallow on a table. The children were told that they'll be left alone for 15 minutes, and if they didn't eat the marshmallow, they could get a second one. What researchers discovered was that after the scientists would walk out, over 70% of the children would give in to temptation and eat the marshmallow before time was up. It's a perfect example of how weak-willed this age group can be, and it proves that if we were to successfully save this kid, there's a high chance he would get possessed after entering the 
diner. It's way too risky to bring one into the group, and as terrible as it sounds, we should assume that every child is a possessed enemy and never let one in. The waitress manages to deliver the baby in a surprisingly short amount of time. They're all happy to see something so wonderful come out of this awful situation, but soon this woman is going to betray every single one of them. Across the diner, Michael warns the others that God ordered him to kill the baby, but since he chose to disobey, God has sent the Archangel Gabriel to finish the job. He's the most powerful angel in heaven, and they have no choice but to leave right now before he kills them all. Frustrated, the waitress demands to know what is so special about her child that they want it to die, and the angel explains that it was never supposed to be born. As long as he's alive, they're rewriting the future of the human race, and it means there's a chance they convince God to stop the apocalypse. Turning around, Charlie goes over to take back her baby, but the mother suddenly grabs it and rushes to the door. She tells them she's going to hand it over to the possessed, believing their lives will be spared if she does. The others are horrified, and they refuse to sacrifice a baby to save themselves, but that's when a ray of light forces the door open. Michael immediately shoots the woman dead, and Jeep catches the child before it hits the ground making that four down with five more to go. The group is relieved, but that's when the Archangel Gabriel enters the diner, spreading his wings out as he tries to attack the baby, but Jeep pulls it out of the way seconds before a mace smashes into the ground. The restaurant manager fires his gun at Gabriel, but the angel blocks every bullet before slicing through his stomach and knocking the man away. Michael holds Jeep back from trying to save his dad and orders him to get the baby out of here. Handing over a car key, he tells him to find the prophets and learn to read the instructions, but Jeep has no idea what the angel is talking about. Leaving the diner, the survivors open the back door and see the monsters lined up in rows, but all their eyes are closed. It's freaky as hell, and the group walk towards the car as the possessed creatures stand aside, waiting for their orders. Inside the diner, Michael confronts Gabriel, and the angel scolds him for disobeying God, making it clear he must die as punishment. Approaching him, Michael argues that he'll suffer any consequence knowing that the child lives, and begs him not to fight, but Gabriel refuses to betray God. He pushes the angel away, spreading his wings, and rushes towards Michael. The two of them start attacking each other, but it's clear Gabriel has the upper hand. The two angels lock weapons, but Michael gets kicked into a wall before dodging his next blow. He does everything he can to fight back, and finally gains the advantage. Forcing the Archangel to drop his mace, Michael knocks him to his knees and jumps on his back, choking the guy out, but Gabriel has one last trick up his sleeve. Okay, these angels are not as strong as you might think. Gabriel and Michael are clearly skilled in combat, but aside from their bulletproof wings, neither of them have shown any supernatural abilities. For example, when Michael smashes a TV over Gabriel's head, it leaves a cut on his face, proving this guy can be wounded just like a human, and that simple observation is going to help us figure out how to kill him. If it were me, I would have had the others stay and fight, telling them to surround Gabriel so that they can shoot him from as many directions as possible. He might be able to wrap his wings around himself for protection, but this still exposes his head and legs, giving us a good chance to kill him with enough ammunition. Now we have to consider that killing this angel could have devastating consequences, because it might cause God to intervene directly, which is f***ing terrifying. He could literally show up and wipe us out with the snap of his fingers, but since he hasn't already, we need to make sure we aren't putting ourselves in a position to force his hand. Now, if you remember when Michael first arrived on Earth, he tore off his own wings and it unlocked his collar, setting him free from God's influence. This made Michael effectively human, giving him the ability to defy God and make his own choices. That's why if it were me, instead of killing Gabriel, I would first try cutting off his wings to set him free. That way he's separated from God and has no choice but to join us again against the angel army. Just like Michael, losing his wings makes him a fallen angel, and that means in God's eyes, he is no less sinful than mankind, the very thing he's trying to destroy. This is the smartest thing we can do, because it lets us take out the archangel without escalating the situation, and God won't be forced to step in. Picking up his mace, he twists the handle, extending a hidden spike straight through his body, and Michael falls to the floor. Gabriel apologizes for what he's done, as the other angel begins to glow, before disappearing with no trace he was ever there. Hearing a strange sound from the kitchen, Gabriel walks behind the counter and sees Jeep's dad lying on the floor with a lighter held up against the leaking stove. He realizes that the man is going to blow the diner up and tries to run away, but the building explodes with him inside, burning the possessed horde into ashes. That's five down, with four more to go. Meanwhile, Jeep notices these strange tattoos threading across his arm and realizes these are the instructions Michael was talking about. 
That's when they spot a sign announcing they've reached the Red Ridge National Park and remember hearing on the radio that a group of survivors have gathered there. Checking for more weapons, Audrey tells them they've only got a flare gun, but that's when something attacks the vehicle. It's Gabriel, and he's here to finish the job. The angel rips off the police flasher so he can get to the child, and Jeep shoots through the roof, knocking him off balance, but he manages to hang on to the trunk. Desperate, the girl fires the flare gun, and luckily, it hits the archangel in the face, but he still won't let go. Furious, Gabriel climbs into the vehicle, knocking the girl out, and grabs a hold of Jeep. He's going to crash the car with them inside of it, but the man has an idea. Suddenly, Jeep stomps on the brakes, sending the angel flying through the windshield, but the car goes rolling off the road. It flips over into a ditch, and all the passengers are knocked unconscious. Later, they wake up in the car and slowly crawl out of the wreckage, but realize that the girl has died in the accident, making that six down, with three more to go. The survivors continue their journey up a nearby mountain, desperate to get to safety, but that's when they see a familiar face. Gabriel is still alive and coming straight for them. He flies in, kicking Jeep against a rock, and knocks him out. The waitress tries running away, and all almost falls off the edge of the cliff. The angel approaches her, demanding she hand over the baby, but Charlie refuses, and he makes it clear that now he'll kill them both. Suddenly, Jeep jumps on him from behind and knocks him off the mountain, sending them falling off the cliff. They land on the ground below, and Gabriel throws the man off of him. Standing back up, he pulls his knife out and is about to kill Jeep, but a light suddenly shines down from the heavens as Michael comes flying in. Gabriel is shocked, since he disobeyed God's orders, but the angel explains that God needs his servants to do the right thing and not blindly obey like Gabriel. Michael pulls out a sword, and the archangel charges at him, but he's too slow. Wounded, he falls to the ground, begging for death, but Michael chooses to spare his life and call it even. The angel flies off and abandons his mission as Michael tells Jeep that he's now the protector of humanity's future and soars into the air, leaving the man behind. He climbs back up the mountain, reuniting with the waitress, and they stare at a settlement in the distance. It's a sign that other people have survived the apocalypse, but soon they'll have to face the deadliest threat of all, parenthood. But what do you think? How would you be Legion? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.